The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, the fourth Sunday in this season of Lent. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us and appreciate the gifts you bring to our worship by participation. I do want to remind us of our uh, Wednesday worship at 6 p.m., led by our youth each Wednesday of Lent, the season of Lent. And you can find the links for that in our, um, if you go to our website, you'll see the services posted there each Wednesday. And uh, then there's also the fellowship op opportunities that continue on Sunday afternoons between 2 and 3. And again, the link for that will be attached to the bulletin that you can call up um, and also on the website. See that on the website. I do want to extend uh, an ongoing invitation for any of you who may wish to uh, participate in leading worship, in liturgy, prayers of the people, in donating flowers uh, to our uh, Sunday morning worship services. And speaking of flowers, the beautiful flowers that you will see beside the pulpit are given by the Carney family in honor of Carolyn's mother, Dolly Watkins. So we thank you very much for donating those today. And now I invite Mark Gooch, our chair of uh, faith and practice, to tell us about the upcoming uh, special offering that will be received on Easter Sunday, the one great hour of sharing. Mark, thank you for giving that to us. And then we will prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about the One Great Hour of Sharing offering typically collected at this time of year on Palm Sunday. The funds collected by the offering go to support three PCUSA agencies, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, and Self-Development of People. This morning I would like to tell you a bit more about two of those agencies. Fighting hunger is at the heart of our Presbyterian understanding of mission. Jesus fed the hungry and told his disciples to do the same. Yet, we know that hunger is an extremely complex phenomenon with economic, political, and social causes. Thankfully, Presbyterian churches are feeding hungry people in their neighborhoods with food pantries, soup kitchens, community meals, community gardens, backpack programs, and more. This important hunger ministry is vital to people who are hungry today. The National Presbyterian Hunger Program celebrates this vital work of local congregations and complements it by doing root cause work to help address the underlying questions of why people are hungry in order to reduce ongoing hunger. Presbyterian Hunger Program's mission is clear alleviate hunger and eliminate its causes. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Presbyterian Hunger Program complements the work of Presbyterian congregations through strategic partnership collaborations, print and web educational and worship materials, and participatory programs so that Presbyterians go, join, and act to end hunger for our neighbors next door and across the planet. Presbyterian Hunger Program approaches hunger holistically with five tools. Direct food relief combined with root cause work, sustainable development, advocacy, intentional and sustainable living, and education. The other program I'd like to talk about is the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Agency. It enables congregations and mission partners of the PCUSA to witness to the healing love of Christ through caring for communities adversely affected by crises and ca catastrophic events. If you go to their website right now, you will find examples of their current responses to events such as Kentucky flooding, winter storms, Hurricane Iota in Central America, internally displaced persons in Cameroon, the Beirut explosion, and of course, COVID-19 response. 
Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is the Emergency and Refugee Program of the Presbyterian Church USA. The core budget, including staff and administrative costs, is funded through the One Great Hour of Sharing, and its program work is additionally funded through designated gifts. Among other things, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance focuses on the long-term recovery of disaster-impacted communities, provides training in disaster preparedness for presbyteries and synods, works collaboratively with church partners and members of the Action by Churches Together Alliance internationally and nationally with other faith-based responders, and it connects partners locally and internationally with key organizations active in the response, such as the United Nations, national voluntary agencies active in disaster, the World Food Program, Red Cross, FEMA, and others. These are just two of the agencies supported by the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. I encourage you to support these efforts with a contribution to this special offering. Contributions can be sent to the church office and designated for one great hour of sharing. Thank you. Good morning. The music for this fourth Sunday of Lent comes from three masters of the 20th and 21st century. First of all, Flor Peters, uh, who was born in Belgium in 1903 and lived until 1986. He was the director of the conservatory in Antwerp and served as organist at Mechelen Cathedral for an astounding 43 years. He had a great interest in Gregorian chant, and I think you can hear the character of that interest in some of his slower pieces, including the aria, which is our piece for today, probably his most played organ work. Our second composer is Charles Callahan, who was born in 1951 in Massachusetts and now lives in Vermont. He's a graduate of the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia and the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He's well known for his arrangements of American hymn tunes for choir and instrumentalists, and you'll hear one of those today, the hymn tune Consolation, taken from Kentucky Harmony, a shape note hymnal that was first published in 1816 including uh, 143 tunes, many of which have made their way into our hymnal today. The final composer is Norman Gilbert, a Brit who lived from 1912 to 1975. He grew up in Yorkshire and held church positions in Halifax and Ladino. He served in the military in World War II and then uh, became a music teacher at Headlands Grammar School in Swindon. The eclogue heard today is likely his most frequently played organ work. Our guest musician today is Sophia Backstrom, one of the many talented youth here at First Pres. Sophia is a sophomore at Worcester High School, and in addition to her membership in the concert band, uh, she's also a swimmer and a soccer player. We thank Sophia for sharing her gifts with us this morning. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Come, all who need justice, God weaves in us the path of life. Come, all who need peace, God weaves in us the way of truth. Come, all who need comfort, God weaves in us a sure hope. Come, all who need healing, God weaves in us the promise of wholeness. Come, all who need community, God weaves in us the love of Christ. Come, all who need God, for God weaves in us the heart of the divine. Come, let us worship the one who is welcome and love. Let us pray. Sometimes we feel like wanderers in the wilderness, O oh God, not sure which way to turn, feeling lost and alone. Help us to remember even the wilderness can be a place of life and healing, and that with you we can face our fears. Help us remember that you are always with us. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession and then pray silently. Like our spiritual ancestors wandering in the desert, sometimes we grow impatient and lose our trust in you, gracious one. When that happens, heal and forgive us, O oh God. Sometimes fear and mistrust get the best of us and we respond harshly or we panic or we run and hide. When that happens, heal and forgive us, O oh God. Sometimes we ignore you, sacred one. We know what you would have us do, yet we do other things. When that happens, heal and forgive us, O oh God. Sometimes we live as though you are far away and not as close as our breath. When that happens, Heal and forgive us, O oh God. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. In every wilderness, on every road, in every moment, in every life, God is with us, bearing the gifts of forgiveness, courage, and unending love. So let us, with renewed hope, celebrate the richness and diversity of life in God's presence. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hi, church family. We sure miss gathering with you in person, but we're excited to bring you the children's message today. It comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 34. Jesus told a story about a farmer who was very successful. His land was producing more crops than he could even contain. The farmer chose to keep all his crops to himself. He thought if he stored his wealth, he wouldn't have to worry about his future or work for years to come. He tore down his barns to build bigger barns for his hoard of crops. But then the farmer died before he even had a chance to enjoy his enormous savings. He had stored up treasures on earth but not treasures in heaven. Jesus goes on to say there's more to life than food and clothing. Jesus knew people often thought so much about what they would eat and what they would wear. They judged what others had or didn't have and missed out on others' treasures. Jesus told the disciples to consider how the birds and flowers live. What could we possibly what could 
we possibly learn from the ravens and lilies? Ravens and lilies do not worry about storing up vast amounts of food. They live for they amounts of food. They live eat they live for each day and do not worry about the next day. They are they are a part of God's creation and do their parts for the ecosystem. Imagine of the raven soared up, stored up, and all the nuts. What would the squirrels or chipmunks eat? Imagine if the lilies soaked up all the nutrients from the soil. How would the other plants grow? Instead, a healthy ecosystem is formed when each creature takes what it needs and leaves what it doesn't. This way, the whole system becomes a treasure. If we spend our, our energy on treasure that will last and trust God for our needs, does that, does that mean it is wrong to save our resources? No, God wants us to be wise without money or privilege and our, oh, and our property. That's being a good steward. And when we use our privileges, money and prop, money and property for love and justice, there is less worry in the world. We know our community is fed, is fed, clothed, sheltered, and loved. Perhaps you have too much of something or more than you could possibly use. Talk about to do with access. What could you give away or put, put, or put to better use for someone else. Let us pray together. Creator God, you made a world with abundant resources, enough to feed and clothe everyone. Help us to trust you for the future, to use our resources well and become generous people so everyone will have what they need. Amen. Gracious and loving God, be our guide on this journey of Lent. Open our ears to hear your words of challenge and your words of grace. Open our hearts to love all that you would have us love, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our enemies, and strangers in our midst this beautiful planet that is our home and all loving things, the crocuses that bloom along Bell Avenue, the last lonely traces of snow at Worcester Memorial, and the red-winged blackbirds trilling to us at Oak Hill Park. Loving and gracious God, we pray for your courage and wisdom to follow you in our daily lives so that the distractions that are always present with us, our anxieties and struggles, worries, challenges, grief and fears, will not have the power to push us off your path. Help us stay focused on your love. You love us so much that you came to be one of us. You walk beside us, you dwell within us. You, our creator, our redeemer, our hope. We trust in your presence here with us and your presence throughout the world. We know there are many, many places where people suffer through illness or loneliness or grief, cruelty and violence. Give us the courage to bear witness to suffering and guide us to respond to all with compassion and faith and generosity through our resources, our prayers, our words, and our actions. We also know, Holy Spirit, that throughout the world you inspire hope, you promise new life, and engage in extravagant acts of generosity and courage. We thank you, we praise you for creating each day, every day, infinite new opportunities for us to love you and to love our neighbor and to see your face in everyone we meet. With gratitude and humility, we pray in the name of your son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying these familiar words. Now, 
Let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament text for this fourth Sunday of Lent comes from the book of Numbers. And I find it a most disturbing text, uh, the outline of the story. Uh, and especially, I think, as we come to the end of a year and the beginning of a second year under this pandemic with all of the loss of all kinds, all of the suffering and the death. So I hesitated even bringing this text to the table today. So if, if you'll bear with me, if you'll make a little uh, textual journey along with me, let us see if we can rest uh, some hope, some word of comfort out of this text. So I'm reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. 
the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. In my personal library, in the pastor's study, I have a book entitled Preaching Hard Texts of the Old Testament. Needless to say, this passage from the book of Numbers made it into that book. This is indeed a hard text. God is punishing God's people extremely harshly because they complained but to punish them with death by serpent bite seems even more than harsh. The Holy One, the Heavenly Father, Divine Protector, who had led Abraham's children out of slavery in Egypt, now turns to devour them. At least, that is the interpretation of the storyteller. In the ancient world, this is how things were explained. The gods were in control, and sometimes good things happened, and sometimes bad things happened. I can imagine there were times when the poets and storytellers got it right, and other times when they simply needed to speak their pain or howl against the darkness of the night. In our day, we know that many things happen that bring us joy or pain. Happenings that are not controlled by good or evil spirits. In a world where it rains on the just and the unjust alike, we are sometimes desperate for whatever justice we can find or fashion. I trust that our God does not send serpents. But the serpents we experience in our lives are real, just the same. They slip in at times unseen, and their painful bites can be lingering and long. The job that once held promise, but now imprisons, the economy that collapses around the best laid plans, the illness that comes on suddenly out of nowhere, the loss of love or the loss of loved ones. This is the truth in this strange story of the fiery serpents from the book of Numbers. Along with many good things, life brings to us measures of pain and heartache. These hurts cannot be avoided. They are a part of living. The wonder in this story is that the symbol of the pain becomes the means of the healing. The bronze serpent on the pole signaled deliverance from the serpents on the ground. All the people had to do was look up. 
And when they were able to look up, when they could give their full attention to a larger vision beyond their own pain, the serpents did not destroy them. They may still have been bitten, but they could recover and go on. Despite its strangeness, this is a story that has a resonance with us as we journey more deeply into year 2021. We who have been a year under viral pandemic, who have been separated from those we love and those whose company in friendship we crave, those who have known particular troubles and suffered significant personal losses and have struggled not to be broken by them. A story is told by the rabbi Harold Kushner, the author of the best-selling book entitled When Bad Things Happen to Good People. In his book, he relates an old Chinese tale about a woman, a woman whose only son had died. Overwhelmed with grief, she went to a holy man to ask what prayers he might say to bring her son back to life. The holy man replied to her, Fetch me a mustard seed from a home that has never known sorrow. We will use it to drive the sorrow out of your life. The woman set out to find the magical mustard seed. She came first to a splendid mansion, knocked at the door, and said, I'm looking for a home that has never known sorrow. Is this such a place? It is very important to me. They told her, you've certainly come to the wrong place, and began to describe all the tragic things that had recently befallen them. The woman said to herself, Who is better able to help these poor, unfortunate people than I, who have had misfortune of my own? She stayed to comfort them, then, then went on in search of a home that had never known sorrow. But wherever she turned, in hovels and in palaces, she found one tale after another of sadness and misfortune. Ultimately, she became so involved in ministering to other people's grief that she forgot about her quest for the magical mustard seed, never realizing that it had in fact driven the sorrow out of her life Could this be a way forward for us when sorrow overwhelms, when tragedy strikes? Many times, looking up, looking out, turning one's attention toward someone else can bring healing, can bring wholeness. But we must be honest with one another and with ourselves. There are times when things do not work out, when the bronze serpent on the pole is nowhere to be found. Some snake bites do not heal. Some disasters are not redeemed. Some evils are not turned to good. Some losses we carry with us all our days, and nothing turns them into joy. Rabbi Kushner wrote his book in response to the death of his son, Adam, excuse me, his son, Aaron, at the age of 14. In his words, Kushner says, 
I am a more sensitive person, a more effective pastor, a more sympathetic counselor because of Aaron's life and death than I ever would have been without it. And I would give up all those gains in a second if I could have my son back. If I could choose, I would forego all the spiritual growth and depth which has come my way because of our experiences and be what I was 15 years ago, an average rabbi, an indifferent counselor, helping some people and unable to help others, and the father of a bright, happy boy. But I cannot choose. Not all hurts can be healed. Not all losses are erased, even when good comes from them. Not all that is broken can be made whole, at least not in the world we know. But our stories tell us that there are worlds we do not know. The storytellers remind us that deliverance may come out of the worst disasters. They hold the bronze serpents aloft, and we must have the imagination and courage to lift our heads, cast our gaze, tune our ears. The nights may be dark Indeed, but our story says that hope comes with the morning. Our hope is this. When we find ourselves in that deep and dark snake pit, we might look up. We might look onward. And in that vision, know that we are not alone and that our God may bring healing and wholeness in ways we cannot even imagine. May it be so for you, and for me. Amen.
I wonder if we can even imagine, after all we have been through, the world has been through, all that the world and we are still going through, is it even possible to imagine a healer of our every ill, a light for each tomorrow? Could we even receive hope beyond our fear and hope for each and every tomorrow? Is that too much to ask of ourselves? As vaccines are spreading, thanks be to God, as we begin to move out of such a strict time of separation and lockdown, as friends begin to carefully come back together, as we talk about returning carefully to this sanctuary to worship together with each other, can we imagine? This transition time towards a post-pandemic life will be easier for some of us than for others. There are many who have suffered the deepest losses. There will be times when we may feel we can't go on. Let us then remember that we are never going on alone. The Spirit of God leads us forward. And our faith teaches us that together, as the body of Christ, we help one another. Each and every part looks out for each and every other part. So let us look to our fellowship. Let us lean on one another. And sometimes let us faith for one another when faith seems hard and distant for us alone. May it be so. May it be so. As you leave worship, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service each and every day of our lives. And may God's hope, peace, joy, and love abide always with you. Amen.